restored CA Dr. Girish Ahuja. Dr. Ravi Gupta taught at Sri Ram College of Commerce for a long period of time and superannuated uh, this year. He had done his graduation and post-graduation from Sri Ram College and from Delhi School of Economics. Dr. Gupta is also uh, an advocate in terms of having done his LLB and he has been he was awarded his PhD in international finance from the Faculty of Management Studies, University of Delhi. Dr. Ravi Gupta has vast practical experience in handling tax matters of trade and industry at all levels, and he is a consult he has been appointed a consultant to various companies, including the non-profit the NGOs, and so on. Dr. Ravi Gupta was nominated member of the committee, which was formed by the government of India to review tax laws and to see what clauses led to litigation or adversely impacted the ease of doing business. He was also appointed as the government nominee on the very prestigious Central Council of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. Ravi has authored several books on direct taxation, not only for the students of the university, but also for professionals. His ready reckoners, his guide to the TDS, the capital gains are a few that I remember every student, I'm sure, of accountancy, B from honors, and anyone doing taxation is familiar with. Dr. Ravi Gupta has delivered more than 1,500 lectures on not only direct taxes but all related topics, which have been organized by the ICI, ICSI, Tables of Commerce, different management institutes, universities, and of course, he has been part of the corporate training program for companies like Airtel, Aircell, NCPC, CFC, Focus, etc. Dr. Ravi Gupta is also founder and president of Tax Law Educo Educare Society, which is a non-profit making voluntary organization whose main objective is to educate general public and professionals on taxation, law, and allied matters for the last 10 years. With that, I'm also going to add one thing that I am very proud of. I have known Ravi, I think, for more than 40 years because both of us were together in our post-graduation and we have, even at that point of time when he started his career, I remember from pure drink, Ravi as a young professional was a shining star, even with Mr. Charanjit Singh, who was the uh, uh, CMD of pure drink. And I think in the shortest span of time, Ravi had won his confidence. Of course, from there, the journey is a very, 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 I would say, meteoric rise with his own tax consultancy coming up. And of course, teaching at Sri Ram College of Commerce, I think there is no looking back. And the biggest quality which Ravi has, above all, is not only he's a good human being, but the kind of humility that I have seen in him, I think it's a very, very rare quality, which everybody must emulate. Thank you, Ravi, for being with us. And I'm sure the participants are really going to take back a lot from today, and so will we. Over to you. Uh, Ma'am, I will also take one more minute. Sure. Uh, Dr. Ravi Gupta, uh, I mean, I was his student at the Shiram College of Commerce. And uh, when, uh, when I was graduating from the college, so I asked for his, his autograph in my <laughs> autograph diary. That was 1994. And he wrote one golden sentence, which I use so many times. He has, he said, have the courage to accept what you can't change and change what you can. Jis cheech ko aap change nahi kar sakte, usko accept karna seekhe. Aur jis ko change karna kar sakte, usko change kare. And I've tried, followed this in last 26 years. Aur sir ka jitna affection, jo aapne humility ki baat ki, mene to, ये भी देखा है कि सर के यहां जब कई बार सर के यहां कभी लंच टाइम में जाओ तो कभी भी आप बिना खाना खाए नहीं आ सकते और सर खुद लंच सर्व करते हैं 
एक 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 चीज आपकी प्लेट में डाल के देते हैं और कहते हैं कि मुझे शौक है ये शौक नहीं है सर ये आपका लव एंड अफेक्शन है तो मैंने हर स्टेप पे सर को पिछले 26 साल में मुझे तो जब भी जरूरत पड़ी है एक कॉल करने की जरूरत होती है दैट इज इज ह्यूमिलिटी एंड दैट इज इज लव एंड अफेक्शन फॉर एन ऑर्डिनरी स्टूडेंट लाइक मी मैं श्रीराम कॉलेज में सर ने हजारों स्टूडेंट्स को पढ़ाया है मैं भी उनमें से एक लेकिन सर जो अपना कनेक्ट बना के रखते हैं और जिस सिंप्लिसिटी से पढ़ाते हैं मतलब सो अनज्यूमिंग कि पता ही नहीं चलता कि आपको टॉपिक कब शुरू हुआ कब खत्म हुआ और वो आपको समझ में भी आ जाता है सो आई एम वेरी फॉर्चुनेट दैट यू नो डॉक्टर रवि गुप्ता एंड डॉक्टर गिरीश आहूजा दोनों का लव एंड अफेक्शन मिलता है एंड सर आपने हमारे कहने पर आज यहाँ आना भी एक्सेप्ट किया दो सेशन आप ले रहे हैं थैंक यू सो मच सर मुझे पता है कितने ज्यादा बिजनेस है और उसके बाद भी आप यहाँ सेशन ले रहे हैं और पावर पॉइंट प्रेजेंटेशन भी बनाई है मैं तो पहली बार देख रहा हूँ पावर पॉइंट प्रेजेंटेशन और नाम भी बड़ा अच्छा रखा है विल वायबिलिटी एंड वैलिडिटी आई थिंक दिस इज वॉट ऑल वी नीड टू नो थैंक यू वेरी मच सर एंड ओवर टू यू Sir, request you to please unmute, sir. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Rita ji. Good morning, Sanjeev. Good morning, uh, Anjali ji. All the participants. I have been feeling very humiliated for the last five minutes. Rita ji speaking so much about me, so much, so kind of you, Rita ji. Thank you so much. As you just said, I have known you for almost forty years, and the journey has been very pleasant. And we have shared so many moments, ups and downs in life, and I really appreciate you are having asked me to join me here in this session today. He has been an illustrious student at Shri Ram College. Thereafter. He has continued to be in touch, and, it, and we are very proud of him. He has achieved a lot of things in life, and we hope that he raises to every occasion. And we will always be looking forward to you, Sanjeev. It is a pleasure to be here amongst this group today. The topic assigned for to me today is regarding wills. May not be a very pleasant topic to discuss, but yes, a very important one. We all feel that why should I write a will? Abhi to mujhe kuch nahi ho raha hai. I'm still here for so many years. Why should I write a will? But will life is uncertain. Do chizi ham hamesha kehte hain two or two things which are certain in life, right? Taxes and death. and unfortunately we deal with both of them we entirely deal with taxes and the inevitable incidence of the death and in order to avoid disputes in order to bring certainty we are supposed to write a will there are a lot of advantages of writing a will so we must know this concept we must try to understand how to write a will what are the consequences etc so in this presentation that i have for you today normally we are not in the habit of making a presentation but in these times of covid when we are not talking face to face when we are talking over the screen so i thought it would be a little easier for the participants to understand through a presentation so i made this small presentation on will and then we will have another presentation on private trusts So these are very two important concepts that we will be dealing today. Now, if I start with the first important thing as to what is a will, हम लोग सब सुनते तो हैं बार will के बारे में, but let us try to understand what is the meaning of the term will. A legal definition has also been given. It is defined in the Indian Succession Act. where it means it is a legal declaration of the intention of a testator with respect to his property which he desires to be carried into effect after his death ab agar is definition ko analyze kare 
तो इसमें सारा मीनिंग हमें जितना चाहिए विल के बारे में दैट इज ऑल ब्रॉट आउट वेरी क्लियरली सी विल इज नथिंग बट ए डिक्लेरेशन हम विल में ये बताते हैं दैट आई वॉन्ट माई एसेट्स टू बी डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड इन अ पर्टिकुलर मैनर सो आई मेक अ डिक्लेरेशन इन दी विल वॉट इज द डिक्लेरेशन इट इज द इंटेंशन ऑफ द पर्सन मेकिंग द विल उसको हम टेस्टेटर कहते हैं so the person who is making a will gives a declaration that my intention is that after my death after i am no more there then how should my property be distributed to various persons so this is primarily what i call a will three important aspects which emerge from this it is a legal declaration it is regarding the intention of the person making it and it is in respect of his property when does the will come into force it always come into force after the death of the person it is always posthumous so therefore the intention of the will is not to distribute the assets during the lifetime of the person the intention is only to distribute it once the person is no longer there consequently the will can be changed as many number of times as a person wants till the time that is alive and the general principle of law says that the last will will prevail so if a person has executed a will today doesn't mean that becomes final tomorrow if he wants to change the beneficiaries he can do that he can write another will he can change his original will till the time that he is alive and if let us say there are 10 wills which have been executed by him the last will which was executed before his death that is the will which will prevail right and if a person does not write a will then how does the property distribute then the property will be distributed as per the provisions of the prevailing law we have the hindu succession act we have the indian succession act so according to those provisions then the property is distributed amongst various categories of the legal heirs that he has left behind we have category 1 heirs we have category 2 heirs but that is only when the will is not there if a person does not leave a will we say that he has died intestate that is without a will then the provisions of law shall come into force now with that then i would like to Take you to various terms that we use when we are discussing about a will. The first important term that we come across is a testator. Testator is the person who makes the will. The person who makes the declaration. He is called the testator, and also we sometimes refer to him as the legator. So he can be either called a testator or the legator. the person who makes the will the person who gets the benefit of the property the person who enjoys the property of the testator is called the beneficiary so beneficiaries are the persons who will get ultimately the property of the testator beneficiary is also called a legatee so we use these two terms either a beneficiary or a legatee to the persons who get the benefit of the assets of the testator another term that we will be coming across is what we call a probate of a will what do i mean by a probate probate is a legal process whereby a court certifies the genuinity of the will so in most of the cases when a person leaves a will he will have to the successors the legal heirs will have to get a probate from the court in order to give effect to that will we will discuss this subsequently but i just want to explain the various terms that we'll be using in a will we also have an executor executor is a person who is given the responsibility of distributing the assets of the testator after his death as per the terms of the will executor may or may not be a beneficiary 
generally we prefer to keep a person as an executor who is not a beneficiary of the trust of the will because in that case he acts as an independent person so whatever assets have been left behind it is his duty to see that the assets are distributed to the various beneficiaries as per the terms of the will another important person in execution of the will is the witness the law requires that in a will there should be at least two witnesses who must both sign together who must witness the will together when the will is executed now witnesses play a very important role whenever there is a will whenever they we ask for a probate whenever there is a challenge to a will whenever there is a dispute regarding the will the witnesses play a very important role so when a person is writing a will he must see that two reliable persons act as witnesses these witnesses have to sign and testify that the will has been executed before us we have witnessed the signing of the will the testator has signed the will in our presence the entire execution of the will may depend upon these witnesses and the stand that they take so therefore we must have two very important witnesses when executing a will we also use a term called a holograph will holograph will we refer to where the will has been written in the handwriting of the testator if the person writes the will in his own handwriting then in that case even witnesses may not be required because when a person writes a will in his own handwriting then the genuinity of the will is all the more established so that will be referred to as a holograph will i'll come to this again a little later intestate i explained to you this is the term we use when a person dies without leaving a will then we say he has died intestate and in that case the property is distributed as per the prevailing laws that is the hindu succession act or the indian succession act the two major laws that we have in india regarding these then these two terms we have discussed in detail who is the testator legator the person who is making the will the beneficiary or legatee is the person who inherits the property in the will or the person who enjoys the benefit of the will these are called the beneficiaries or we also call them a legatee we were discussing about what is probation of a will probate is defined under the indian succession act it means a copy of a will certified under the seal of a court of competent jurisdiction with a grant of administration to the estate of the testator so in case of a probate what i have to do is the legal heirs the beneficiaries they will present the will in a court the court will issue a notice to all the known legal heirs whether they are beneficiaries or not notice goes to all the beneficiaries all the legal heirs an advertisement is a public notice is given in the leading newspapers inviting any objections to the will and then the court after hearing all the concerned persons all the interested persons certifies that the will is genuine and the terms of the will may be executed this is called a probate right we call it it is a judicial process whereby a will is proved in a court and accepted as a valid public document that is true last testament of the deceased now we will discuss a little later again whenever a will is made in all probability there is going to be a dispute we say wherever there is a will there is a dispute because in case of a will 
we will always have a disgruntled relative a person who does not get anything or a person who feels that he has got a little lesser share he is always disgruntled and he will always try to challenge the validity of his will what are the challenges what are the objections raised to the will we will discuss that but it, it is because of this, this aspect that the probate becomes necessary when you approach a court for a probate of the will there is normally a fee that has to be paid a court fee earlier it used to be as a percentage of the assets which which go through the will that time it involved a huge amount of money but now in most of the states the court fees has been limited to maybe 50000 rupees or maybe about 80000 rupees in some states so it is a very reasonable amount that you have to pay as court fees to get the probate of the will another term that i used in the execution of the will was an executor an executor is someone who is named in a will or who is appointed by the court who is given the legal responsibility to take care of a deceased financial obligations from disposing the property paying bills etc and then distribute the property to the beneficiary so executor can be either named by the person who is making the will or if there is no executor named by that person then the court can also appoint an executor so the responsibility of the executor is that if there are any debts of the deceased person any financial obligations of the deceased person he will discharge those obligations and then whatever assets are left behind of he will distribute those assets as per the terms of the will the assets will be distributed to the beneficiaries as per the terms of the will i mentioned to you that is a, it is very important to have reliable witnesses to a will there are at least two persons who must be witness to the will who must validate the will so witness to a will is a person who participates in the validation of the will document so he certifies that the will was written in my presence whenever a person is signing the will as a witness he must give his full name his age his address his occupation so that the person is easily identifiable there are no disputes regarding who was the witness these days we also try to put in the pan number of that witness so that he is easily identifiable right as i said under the indian succession act you are required to have minimum of two witnesses who will attest the will beneficiary can never be a witness witness has to be an independent person he should not himself be a beneficiary under the will now when a person is signing a will as a witness it is not necessary that he must know what are the contents of the will all that he is signing is that the will has been executed in my presence so if the executor if the person making the will does not want the witnesses to know how the property is being distributed they need not tell the contents of the will to the witnesses only the witnesses will sign will testify that the will has been executed in our presence that is what is required from the witnesses then as i mentioned something about a holograph will which is written in the handwriting of the testator what is what we call a holograph will intestate death i have already explained a person who dies without making a will we say he has died intestate there is no will of that person few points regarding the will who can execute a will 
any person any person who is not a minor and who is of sound mind as we study under the contract act any person who is capable of entering into a contract he can execute a will even if a person is deaf or dumb or blind can also make a will provided they know what are the contents of the will so if a person is let us say deaf we can make him understand someone some independent person can make him understand what he wants to write what has been written in the will and then he can execute that will right he can maybe write in his own handwriting that will make the will more authentic a person who cannot speak may be able to read it so if he can read the will and he can say that i have read the will i have understood it that will may also be genuine so any physical disability will not debar a person from making a will any person can make a will regarding how his assets are to be distributed the main thing about a will is that as we said it is like a contract it is a declaration by a person therefore only a person who is sane who is in sound mind should make a will <clears throat> if a person who is ordinarily insane but sometimes during certain intervals he is of sound mind during those intervals he may make a will even if it go conversely uh, then if a person is normally sane but let us say he is under the effect of toxication at that point of time if he makes a will then that will may not be considered to be a genuine will so that can be challenged and in most of the cases the challenge to the will is that when the will was made the person was not in his full senses so therefore it becomes necessary that when a will is being made we must have two proper witnesses if it is possible we must also have a certificate from a doctor appended to the will and the doctor will certify that the will has been executed in my presence i have examined the person and i have found to be in of sound mind that will add authenticity to the will the witness to the will may be a chartered accountant may be an advocate who can also certify that we have explained the contents of the will to the to the executor and he has signed the will only after understanding the contents of the will so these are some points which i must keep in mind when i am making a will will can be executed in any language in plain simple language in hindi english punjabi marathi whatever we are using in any language we can make a will there is no prescribed format for making a will there is no need to have a stamp paper to make a will it can be executed on plain paper it is generally executed on a plain paper and normal language of a person is sufficient to make a will the requirement is it must be signed by the testator and attested by two witnesses as a will is governed by the indian succession act all persons who are governed by this act that is hindus christians buddhist sikhs jains all can make a will as per the provisions of the indian succession act as regards the muslims the law is a little different they are governed by the shariat law under the shariat law muslims can bequeath only one third of their assets through a will so according to the law applicable to a particular person the will can be executed then we have two types of wills one is called a privileged will and another is an unprivileged will what do i mean by a privileged will privileged will is generally a will which is executed by a person 
who is in the armed forces soldiers airmen mariner so persons who are engaged in the army air force navy they are working under different situations difficult situations so we have a different type of will which these persons may execute this will even if it is handwritten even if it is verbal even if he has said what he wants to another person that may also constitute a will there may no there may be no need of having a written will if it is written it may be in his own handwriting in, in his own handwriting there is no need of having witnesses there and even by word of mouth if these have been executed these are considered as valid wills these are as i told you applicable to soldiers airmen mariner etc so this is a special privilege granted to these persons who are working in difficult situations where life and death is not certain so therefore wherever they want they can express the desire that if something happens to me then my assets should be distributed in this particular manner all of the persons the will that they execute is called an unprivileged will so privileged will is only for persons in the forces or other persons will execute the will called an unprivileged will there the requirements of the will should be there it should be written it should be signed it should be witnessed all those conditions will prevail upon those cases we also come across a term which we call a living will this living will is primarily a document detailing a person's desires regarding future medical treatment that an individual does or does not want to have in the event when he she becomes too ill to communicate we have seen some movies also on this where a person is very critical is almost in a vegetable state does not want to live anymore there is no purpose of life left to him as per the prevailing law you cannot kill a person so the doctors will try their best keep on giving him treatment keep on giving him food keep on giving him medicines till the time that he is there can a person himself voluntarily give a declaration when he was in good health can he give a declaration that if such a stage arises i do not want to live we also call this as euthanasia in india although this has been allowed by the supreme court in some of the recent judgments but under very strict control of the judiciary otherwise as you know it can be subject to misuse so here we are talking about a living will that a person may execute while he is alive while he is in his senses that if any situation arises then what does he want to do whether he wants to give that get that treatment or he wants to go peacefully then regarding registration of a will is it compulsory to get a will registered no any will is valid as long as i said it is written it is witnessed there is no compulsion to have a will registered but yes if you get a will registered it is beneficial for the beneficiaries because then the challenge to the will is a little difficult what happens when you get a will registered in case of registration the person goes to the registrar's office signs the will in his presence he is photographed at the office of the registrar witnesses also appear before the registrar their photograph is also taken and it is appended to the will so now it becomes authenticated that the person has signed the will the witnesses have signed the will in the presence of the registrar and therefore it becomes difficult to challenge the will on the ground that it is not genuine however i can i do not say that the will cannot be challenged even a registered will can be challenged in a court of law 
it may be challenged that after this there has been another will so if a registered will is there let us say in october 2020 there is an unregistered will in april 2021 which will will prevail the second will is not registered but still as i told you the latest will prevails so even if i have a registered will anyone can challenge it in a court of law saying that there is a will subsequent to this although a registered will has a greater authenticity than an unregistered will but there can be a lot of challenges there if the testator gets a registered personally it proves that the genesis of the will of course yes reduces the ground in which can be contested but still as i said wherever there is a will we have found there are disputes we have seen so many cases i remember a popular case of uh, lakshmipat singhania the owners of raymen group this person had a lot of shares of the raymen group he is a very wealthy person he he had two sons the elder son took a share and settled outside india the younger son was looking after the business the senior singhania said that i will give all my shares in the company to my younger son because he is looking after the business and said i will take only one flat and a car for my personal use after the will was executed you know what happened he was thrown out of the house he was thrown out of the company he no longer remained a director of the company the flat that was promised to him was also not given because that flat belonged to the company and the younger said son the younger son said how can i give the property of the company to a director so he threw him out of the house and there was nothing left with this gentleman so i have to ensure that when i am writing a will one yes the will has to take place after the death but i should ensure that during my lifetime i have sufficient assets to take care of my own self wills we have seen are subject to challenge and we should take all precautions when executing that will in order to avoid the challenges lastly coming to some income tax implications of the will whenever assets pass on through a will right the son acquires the assets through a will father had acquired it let us say 20 years back today the son gets it then will there be any capital gain tax liability when the son gets the property from his father through the will we have a section 47 under the income tax act where we say that all assets which have been received through a will it is not regarded as a transfer so the son does not pay the any tax when he gets the property of his father through a will however when the son or when the beneficiary ultimately sells that property then he will have to pay the capital gain tax and then while computing the capital gain tax the cost of the father that is the cost of the previous owner will be deemed to be the cost for the person who sells the property so therefore the capital gain tax will arise only when the beneficiary sells the property or transfers the property when he gets the property through a will at that point of time there is no tax that he has to pay then we have very important section 56 to 10 under which any person who receives any gift of money any immovable property any movable property of a value exceeding 50000 rupees the amount is deemed to be the income of the recipient so if a person receives any gift of money any immovable property 
or any movable property of a value exceeding 50,000 rupees that is included in his income. However, we say 56 to 10 does not apply where any property is received from a relative. So if a relative gives a gift to his own relative, then there is no tax implication here. List of relatives has been defined. It has been given under the Income Tax Act. It's a long list. Long list includes any person, ascendant, descendant, wife, father-in-law, mother-in-law, mossy, mossa, chacha, chachi, all those are included in the term relative. Second most important provision there is that wherever any assets are received under a will or by way of inheritance, this provision is not triggered. So therefore, there is no implication of whatever assets are received under a will. Whether those assets are received by a relative or maybe even from a non-relative, if these are received under a will or by way of inheritance, then there is no tax implication at this stage. Another thing that I would like to explain that through a will, we can also create a private trust for the benefit of certain beneficiaries. <coughs> what is this purpose? So in those cases where a person feels that he has certain successors, he has certain children who may not be able to take care of themselves. Maybe they are handicapped maybe they are retarded, maybe they are not physically capable of handling the assets. So in that case, what he can do is, he can create a trust through a will. I will examine this in detail also when I'm making a presentation on the private trust. But wherever a trust is created through a will, that means a person writes in his will that once I'm not there, the assets will go to a trust which will be handled by a trustee, one or more trustees, and the proceeds of that trust of the income shall be utilized for the benefit of certain beneficiaries who have been specified in that trust. So now this, uh, these assets are handed over to a trust. The trust manages the assets and the income or the assets will be used for the benefit of the specified beneficiary. In this case, the taxation provision say that the trust will be taxable at the same rate applicable to the beneficiaries. Because this is in fact the income of the beneficiaries. However, if there is any business being carried out by the trust, then the trust pays the tax at the maximum marginal rate. Maximum rate means it at present it amounts to about 40 to 43 percent. So the trust will have to pay the tax at that rate. In this case, again, the liability to pay the tax is on the executor. Executor again is the trustee. So any person who is executing the will is also responsible for paying the taxes. The tax can be collected from the executor, although the executor can in turn recover it from the estate of the person. I will deal with these executors, etc. 168. I will deal with this in the private trust. But this is how the liability of the trust, the tax liability is to be discharged. The executors, as I told you, become liable to pay the tax on behalf of the trust. I think we will not discuss these provisions. These becomes a little more technical. If anyone has any interest in a trust, in a private trust, I have a small presentation on that. And there, I think we will discuss these implications. So on the basis of this discussion that we just had, why is making of a will important? Because then I ensure that the property is shared upon my decision. I decide how the property is to be distributed. It is made with an intention to prohibit family disputes so that I have laid down how the property is distributed. 
although this may or may not be achieved in actual cases, all the assets that a person has should be listed in the will, although after the will he can acquire more assets, but all the assets are listed there. Uh, once you have executed a will, then you feel a little relieved. You feel that I have done whatever I could, whatever assets I had, I had taken care of them. So then you become free and you can live as a child again. Whatever you want to give as charity, business legacy, you can specify that will itself. If you want to give some properties in charity, you can do that also through a will. You can provide your own security, you can protect your business. If a person dies without executing a will, there are laws of inheritance which direct how the deceased assets are to be distributed. As I mentioned, we have the Hindu Succession Act, we have the Indian Succession Act, then the property is distributed as per the provisions of that act. Everyone then gets a share in the property as per that law. Then it is not as per my discretion, it may go to certain relatives whom I did not want it to go to. So then I have no control over that property. In some cases, I feel that if I am not there, my wife will look after my assets. But I have seen certain cases, my very close friend, where both the husband and wife died in a tragic incident, accident. So in that case, there is no one to look after the property. So it becomes all the more important that I do execute a will, even though I'm very healthy today, even if I know that I'm going to be there for the next several years, but still it makes sense to execute a will. Things which I need to take care of, all names should be written in full, each beneficiary I should describe fully. These names should match with the Aadhaar card or with the PAN card name that is there. Every page of the will should be signed by the testator and the witnesses. If there are any corrections, they should also be signed. Signatures of the person executing the will should match with those recent valid documents may preferably be attested by a bank manager. I should avoid using complicated or technical legal terms. I can make it in a normal language. In the spoken language, I can make a will. Beneficiary should not be a witness. And if possible, have a handwritten will. This is more authentic. Nowadays, it is also becoming a practice that when a person executes a will, he also gets its videograph. So then we have more evidence that when the will was made, he had signed it freely. He was in full senses. The person can make a statement on the video. I am executing it out of our own free will. I am in sound mind. And whatever is written in the will is as per my desire. So if I have a videograph will, the process is videograph, then it adds authenticity to the will. That is what I said, video recording of the will should be made, two witnesses should be there, a doctor's certificate certifying the soundness of the mind. You can have a child accountant or an advocate certifying that the testator was explained the contents of the will. I think these are the points that I need to take care of my while making a will. Certain persons ask, why can I not gift the assets while I'm alive rather than living a will? So what is preferable? Should I give the assets during my lifetime or should I execute a will that the assets should be distributed after I'm not there? See, a person has, has to must ensure that whatever he has earned during his lifetime he must enjoy the benefit of his assets till the time that he's alive. Yeah, it is meant for the children. Give it to them, but not during your lifetime. During your lifetime, whatever is necessary for yourself, keep that with you. After that, hey, bacho kai, bacho kai jana hai, but let it go only after the death of that person. So, if a legal heir, if your children are in need of some money, are in need of certain assets, then you have to act judiciously. You may give something to them right now, but yes, 
whatever you can keep for yourself, keep it with you and distribute it only through a will. That is what is a personal suggestion. Depends upon the circumstances of each person. I mean, this is all that I have to speak about a will. We say that every person should execute a will, but practically we don't do it ourselves. And as Dr. Ahuja was also saying, neither has he nor I still executed a will. We have although tried to make that will, but still we have not formalized it. Before I proceed to the next topic, if anyone has any questions, any observations, we can take those out. Uh, yes, sir. So there are two questions in the Q&A box. Uh, shall I read it out for you? Uh, so there is a question um, that uh, can witness be an independent third party who are not having any connections with beneficiaries of will? In fact, it should be an independent person. The witness should always be an independent person. He may not belong to the family. Generally, if you have a family where you are giving the assets to other persons, some persons are not getting any assets. So if that person who is not getting an asset becomes a witness, agrees to be a witness, then it adds more value to the will. Then that person may not be able to challenge it later on. So what people will do is generally that if, for example, they are distributing the assets to their sons, not giving anything to the daughter, they would insist that the daughter becomes a witness. There's nothing wrong in that. So if I have a family member who is willing to become a witness, if he is not a beneficiary, he can become a witness or any third person, as I said, a child accountant, an advocate, a doctor, any third person can also be a witness to the will. Right, sir. Thank you. So there is another question that if both parents die together, then under Hindu succession act, if children are major, then only children are the inheritors or other relatives are also the inheritors. See, as I told you, under the Succession Act in India, we have different classes of assets. We have firstly the class one heirs. In class one heir, you have the mother, the spouse, and the children. They are all class one heirs. So if there is no will, then the assets will be equally divided amongst the all the class one heirs. So if mother is alive, she gets what she gets an equal share. You are saying husband, wife, both have died, so wife will not be there, spouse is not there. So all children belong to the class one heir. So all of them will get an equal share. Right? If there is no one in the class one, then it is distributed to the assets in the class two heirs. In class two heirs, father is there, brother, sisters are there. So then the property is divided equally amongst all the heirs which may be there in the class two. So that is how the property is distributed if there is no will. Ji, sir. Uh, sir, a core question hai, Anupam ji ne hai. Uh, how does a trust, uh, how does making a trust help in case like you have mentioned for differently able beneficiaries? As I said, the trust is beneficial where I feel that the person for whom I'm leaving the property may not be able to manage the property himself. Right? As I said, that if the children are handicapped, if they are not mentally alert, if they cannot handle the business, if they cannot handle the assets themselves, then I may run a risk that if I get the, give the assets directly to these persons, someone may deprive them of the assets, someone may commit a fraud upon them. So then I may create a trust where I hand over the property to certain trustees. And then these trustees manage the property for the benefit of these beneficiaries. I'll take up these in the detailed presentation that I have regarding the private trust. Okay, sir. sir, there is a question by Prasenjit Royji. He is asking if nominee who has a right to receive the sum insured of life insurance uh, has appropriated the sum 
what right does the beneficiary of the will has against the nominee? Now that this question has been raised, let me clarify what is the difference between a nomination and a succession. See, when I have, let us say, I have a life insurance policy or I have a FD with a bank, there I, it is more appropriate to have a nominee there. If I appoint a person as a nominee, then as soon as this person dies, the nominee gets a right to get that money from the insurance company or from the bank. It eases the process. Otherwise, I'll have to go through the court process and then only the court banks will release the money. Nomination means that upon the death of the person, the nominee is entitled to receive that money. That does not mean that the person will become the owner of that money. The money will be distributed either as per the will or as per, or as per the succession act. The person who gets the money only holds it in trust. It is a different thing that in my will I will write, I may write that the person who is named as a nominee will get the property itself. So then he can give the property. But if I say, if I nominate, let us say, I nominate my son as a person to get the uh, money from the bank, but in my will I write, all my assets shall go to my wife. Then the assets belong to my wife, although his son will get the money from the bank, but he is supposed to hand it over to the mother. So nomination and succession are two different concepts. Nomination does not confer ownership. Nomination only means that the person can get that money from the authority. That is all. Uh, thank you, sir, for explaining in such detail. Uh, sir, there is a question relating to Muslim law that uh, in Sharia law, what percentage of share would daughter have in the parent's property? If you could so, uh, throw some light on this. I am not very sure. Under the Hindu law, now daughters get an equal right that of a son. But under the Sharia law, the primary law says that you cannot even will more than one third of your property. Maximum one third, you have a right to, to, to make a choice as to how the property is distributed. Otherwise, the property mainly goes to the sons. I'm not really very sure whether the daughters have been given an uh, equal right under the Sharia law or not. That we will have to check. Under the Hindu law, we have made that corresponding changes. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, so there is a question by Rajni Thanviji. Uh, is asking when beneficiary is a third person or unrelated person, will the transfer of property will be a deemed income in the hands of recipient? No, as I can say, that whenever a property is received through a will or to succession, it is not regarded as a transfer, neither it is regarded as a gift. So therefore, there is no implication at the time that you receive the property whether it is received by a relative or it is received by a third person. At that point of time, there will be no taxation. Only when the person who receives the property ultimately sells that property, ultimately realizes that property, at that point of time, he will have to pay the tax. At the point that he receives the property, there is no tax implication, whether it is by a relative or by an individual. Uh, ji sir, thank you sir. I think uh, there are no more questions. Um, thank you sir. Now if, we, if the time permits, I will take up another small topic, a related topic relating to private trust. How are private trust forms, what is the purpose and what is the taxation implications of having a private trust. Uh, sir, a uh, uh, few more questions appeared. If you allow, can I ask you one or two more questions? Okay, sir. Uh, sir, there is a question by a CA Webhav Kedia. He's asking if as a CA, he helps his client to prepare the will and also wants to become an executor. Can he do so? Yes, he can. He can be an executor. 
and uh, he may even be a witness to that view. So there is no, no prohibition that he can be executed as well as a witness, or he may only help in drafting of the will and can be named as an executor. He can. Okay, sir. So Anupam ji, sir, has asked in continuation to his question of trustee of differently able beneficiary. He has asked in continuation, can trustee still not use it for his own benefit instead of beneficiary? There are dishonest persons everywhere. We have seen so many movies where the person was a trustee and the property is to be used for the benefit of a person till the age he acquires 21 years of age and the trustee himself tries to see that the person does not attain that age. He is killed before that. There are plenty of examples for that. But as per law, a trustee cannot use the assets or the income for his own benefit. It has to be used for the benefit of the beneficiaries only. Otherwise, it is a breach of trust, which is a punishable offense. And at the time of making a trust for the benefit of disabled relatives, etc., this is the most important challenge that we face of getting a person who can be a worthwhile trustee. So we have to select a person whom we have confidence in and whom we feel will be able to execute the trust as per the spirit of the trust. So that is, yes, it is a big challenge and we'll have to find a proper trust. Ji, sir. Uh, so there is a very small question that is it possible to write will on ancestral assets? If I'm talking about ancestral assets which belong to an H. Ancestral assets, see, there could be two types of assets that we normally call ancestral assets. My grandfather acquired a property. That property passed on to my father. From him, it passes on to me. Then it is my own property. Then no one else has a right in that because I have got that property through inheritance. That property belongs to me. I can always win. If there is a property of a Hindu undivided family, right? it could be a case where my grandfather acquired the property. He said that the property shall henceforth belong to the entire family. Now the property belongs to the HUF. I have a share in that HUF. That share also keeps oscillating. I do not know what is my percentage of share. People may be added to that HUF. People may be deleted from that HUF. At any particular point of time, I do not know what is my share. However, if I'm a member of that HUF, if I die, I can, in my will, I can specify that my share in the HUF will be divided in, so, in such and such manner. So as regards my share in the HUF, I can leave a will. But all the assets of the HUF, I am not the owner, so I cannot win. Whatever is my own asset, whether it is my self-required property, whether I have acquired it through inheritance, whatever is my own property, for that I can make a will. Another allied question which arises is that if I have, let us say, a private limited company, I may be having 99% shares of that company. Can I will the assets of that company to someone? No, those assets do not belong to me. The assets belong to the company. However, what I can do is I can will my shares of that company to it. So by virtue of becoming the shareholder, that person may become virtually the owner of that company. But assets of the company continue to be the assets of that company, which I cannot do. So basic underlying principle is that I can will all the assets that I own, whether they are my own self-required or they are existing. I think that should answer the question. Ji, ji, sir. Uh, sir, there is a last question by Sachin Goyalji. He is asking, if a salaried person dies during service, how the settlements would be done in the absence of nomination? Normally, when a person is service, regarding his provident fund, regarding his pension benefits, the employer does want to have a nomination. If the nomination is there, of course, there will be no problem. The money will be paid to the nominee. 
if there is no nomination then the employer will have no other alternative but to ask the claimant whoever is claiming the money to get a certificate from a court of law then that person will have to see an order from a court as to who are the legal beneficiaries and how this asset is to be distributed about the benefit only after an order from the court has been obtained can the employer legally distribute the retirement benefits to the various legal heirs ji sir thank you sir thank you very much for taking up the questions uh, so we can move on to the next topic now how much time do we have with us i think roughly 45 minutes sir okay. Okay. i'll try to cover this it is try to be not very technical and uh, so that everyone can understand if anyone has any particular query anything that he wants to raise we may be able to discuss that at the end or you may discuss it personally with me I have you. Know, my number can be shared. This is a little difficult topic, but yes, I will try to explain it in a common sense to all the participants. Sure, sir. So this is regarding the private trust. How do we form a trust? What are the tax implications? What are the advantages of having a trust? So normally, we come across two types of trusts. one is called a charitable trust or a religious trust and another is a private trust now the difference between these two is regarding the beneficiary first let me explain to you what is basically a trust trust is a concept where one person has a property he gives that property to someone who is called a trustee to be used for the benefit of a third person whom we call a beneficiary so we have three persons here we have a settler who is giving the property we have a trustee to whom the property is given and we have a beneficiary for whose benefit the property is used if these beneficiaries are private person we call it a private trust they may be my children they may be my brother sister they may be anyone in my family or wherever there is a group of persons we call it a private if it is to be used for the benefit of public at large we call it a charitable so this is the difference between a private trust and a charitable trust mainly regarding the beneficiary so if the beneficiaries are private persons my family members we call it a private So here today we are discussing only about private trust. Charitable trust is entirely a different concept. Private trust also there are two categories of these private trusts. We have specific private trust and discretionary private trust. Specific private trust is normally one where I can explain where. either there is a single beneficiary or if there are more than one beneficiaries i know who are the beneficiaries and i know in what share will they get the benefit so everything is specified either i say that this is a trust for my only son so then there is only one beneficiary the entire property the entire income of that property belongs to him so then there is a single beneficiary we call it a specific trust or let us say i have three sons i say all of them are beneficiary and each one will get one third share or i may say one will get 40% one will get 20% another will get 40% so the shares are defined if the beneficiaries are defined the shares are defined then again it is a specific trust uh sir sorry to interrupt you in between uh sir are you presenting the trust ppts yes uh, sir they are not visible the previous ppts are on the screen okay i'll
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They are very much visible now. Thank you, sir. Right. So I was mentioning about the private trust. I said they could be specific or discretionary. Then when I'm talking about the private specific trust, I said that a specific trust means either there is one beneficiary. I know that who is the beneficiary. I know that the entire income belongs to that beneficiary. I call it specific. If there are more than one beneficiaries, but I know who are these beneficiaries and I know what is their share, how to distribute the income that is definite, then also I call it a specific trust. In case of a discretionary trust, either I do not specify who will be beneficiary or I do not specify what is their share, then I call it a discretionary trust. See, in the first case, I said that I have three children, all of them are beneficiaries, their share is equal. Their share is one third each. Then I call it a specific. Say I have three children, but I create a trust for the benefit of three children. I do not specify their share. I leave it to the discretion of the trustee. I say that the money of the trust will be used for the benefit of these three persons, but the trustees will decide how and when to use this money. So it is left to the discretion of the trustee. Then I call it a discretionary trust. So I can either have a specific trust or I can have a discretionary trust. The taxation of both of these will be quite different. A private trust, if I want to create, I may create it inter vivos or by will. Inter vivos means while I am alive. Today itself, I am here, I am very much alive today. If I want, I may create a private trust for the benefit of certain beneficiaries. Or I may create a private trust through a will. When we are discussing the will, I mentioned that in the will, I may mention that my assets after my death will be distributed in this particular manner. Some assets may go to the individuals, some assets may go to a private trust, which will be created through the provisions of the will. There is an advantage, there is a tax advantage also of creating a trust through a will will come across that. The private trusts are governed by the provisions of the Indian Trust Act 1882. There may be one particular or more than one individual who is the beneficiary. If there are immoral properties which are involved, then the trust will have to be registered. Right? Otherwise, we may have even an unregistered trust. These are the legislations which govern the trust in India. We have the Indian Trust Act 1882. Then we have various state laws which also govern private trust. The registration fees, the process of registration, etc., may be governed by the state laws. The registration of the trust is to be done with the sub registrar as just as you get properties registered. This trust is also to be registered with the sub register. What do I mean by a trust? We say trust is an obligation annexed to the ownership of the property. It arises out of a confidence reposed in and accepted by the owner or declared and accepted by him for the benefit of another or of another and the owner. So privately as I explained, in case of a trust, what happens? We have a person who is having a property. He gives that property in confidence to someone. That person someone is called the trustee. So I give the property to someone who accepts that confidence and agrees to use it for the benefit of another. So that is what we call a trust. 
the author of the trust, the person who reposes the confidence, that is the person who gives the property, is called the author of the trust, or we also call him the settler. Trustee is the person who accepts the confidence, that is the person to whom the property is given, who agrees to be the trustee of that trust. Right? He is called the trustee. Beneficiary is the person for whose benefit the confidence is accepted, or the person for whose benefit the property is to be used is called the benefit. The trust property, whatever property has been given in trust, that we call the trust property, and the trust deed is called the instrument of trust. Now, in case of a private trust, it is very important to have a written instrument of trust because in that trust only, I will explain as to who are the beneficiaries. What is the property that has been given and how that property is to be used? I will also mention who are the trustees, how the trustees can be changed, how the trust is to be managed, how the accounts are to be kept, how the funds of the trust are to be maintained, all these terms, conditions. So these are very important documents, and if I get it listed, then they become a separate entity. So in the trust deed, I must mention the trustee, of course, has to mention with the author, the beneficiary to mention, the purpose of the trust, beneficiaries, trust property, etc. All these have to be mentioned in the document of the trust. Who can create a trust? Again, it is like a contract. Any person who is competent to contract can create a trust. Even a minor with the permission of the court may create a trust. But generally, it is any person who is competent to contract. That is, any person who is major of sound mind can enter into a contract, can create a trust. These are the requisites for creating a proper trust. I must have a trust deed. The author and the settler must be specified. The purpose of the trust must be specified. This, of course, must be lawful. The beneficiary must be specified. The property which is given in trust must be described in that trust deed. Who are the trustees and other particulars, as I mentioned, all these have to be specified in the trust deed. Right. This, of course, we have discussed that this is called the instrument of trust. And although there is no legal format of creating a trust, but we must have a trust deed which must be illustrated. When a trust is created by a will, irrespective of whether the trust is private or public, if it relates to more property, it must be registered. If it is created through a will, the will has to be in writing as per the Succession Act, although we can have a verbal will also in certain circumstances, but generally the will should be in writing. Therefore, if the trust is created through will, that must be in writing also. So if you have the instrument of trust, which is in writing, it is evidence of the existence of the trust. It facilitates the devolution of the trust property, specifies the objectives of the trust. Whether the trust is charitable or private, that can be established through the instrument. And if there is any immoral property involved, then the transfer of the ownership from the settler to the trust is also essential for the Conveyance of that property. Of course, these are some of the benefits that you get for having the trust registered. Who can be the trustee? Every person who is capable of holding property can become a trustee. Any person who is a major, any person who is sound mind. 
Right? Many cases we also find that instead, instead of one single trustee, we can have a number of persons who are appointed as a trustee. That also adds to the authenticity of the trust and it uh, even if one person may not be able to act as a trustee, there are other persons who will be able to take care of it. Now, some point for the trustees, once a person has accepted himself to be the trustee, he cannot renounce that after accepting it. If he wants to renounce his trusteeship, he must get the permission from a court. Or, as for the terms of the trust, if the beneficiary is competent to contract, then the beneficiary may allow the trust to leave, and instead of that, may appoint someone as a trust. Or, if the trust deed itself provides that under so and so circumstances, the trustees may change, then only the trustee may change. Can a trustee who is appointed further delegate his authority to someone else? No. Trusteeship is an important concept. So a person who has been appointed as trustee must act on his own. He cannot delegate any powers to any other person. If a person who is a trustee dies, is becomes insane, then what happens? Then the trustee, as I said, must mention the circumstances as to how another person will be appointed as a trustee. Right? So any person, I, I either either name that, that so and so will be trustee. If he is not there, then so and so will be the trustee. Or I can say that instead of this person, how to nominate another person. So those things must be mentioned in the trustee itself regarding the appointment of new trustee. Who can be a beneficiary? Any individual person can be a beneficiary. It can be one person, it can be more than one person, but the beneficiaries must be identified. So I must mention in the trust in itself that so or so are the beneficiaries of this trust. Now, why do I create a trust? Before I come to taxation, why do I create a trust? As I mentioned, that normally a trust is created for those beneficiaries who may not be able to handle the property themselves. These days, trusts are also created for certain other benefits also. One, whatever is the property of the trust, that cannot be attached by any other authority. If I have my individual assets, and supposing there are obligations upon me which I have to discharge, which I am not able to do, then my individual property can be attached to pay off those debts. But whatever property is belonging to the trust, that property cannot be attached. So trust property is independent, it cannot be attached by any court of law under any procedure. So that is a major advantage why people want to create trust so that this is created for the benefit of certain beneficiary. They enjoy certain immunities here. Recently, there was a lot of talk about inheritance tax being imposed in our country. We used to have estate duty long time back, but then it was abolished in India. At present, there is no inheritance tax. But in certain other countries, we do have this concept of an inheritance tax where whatever property I leave at the time of my death, certain portion of that has to be paid by way of inheritance tax to the government. In some countries, inheritance tax is as high as about 40%, 50%. 50% of the property straight away goes to the government. Now to avoid that again, people had created private trusts so that whenever you transfer the property to the trust, there is no inheritance tax on the property belonging to that trust. So these were, besides tax benefits, certain other benefits for which people were creating trust. 
the taxation of trust is basically governed by two, three major sections, 161 to 164. I will not go into details of this, but explain it in a simpler manner. If you have a specific trust, specific trust means where the beneficiaries are known, their share in the of the trust is known, then the tax is collected by the government or the private trust at the rates applicable to the beneficiary. So whatever the rates prevailing for an individual or the individual beneficiary, that rate will be applicable if we have a specific. However, if this trust is doing a business, then we tax the income of the trust at the maximum rate of tax. Only one exception here, if I have created the trust through a will, if the trust has been created through a will, then even if the trust has business income, it will not be taxable at the maximum. Then you will be taxed at the rates applicable to an individual. The rates applicable to an EO. If I have a discretionary trust, discretionary trust means that either the beneficiaries are not definite or the share of the beneficiaries is not definite, then I tax it as the of 164, where I will normally tax it at the maximum rate of tax. This tax which is to be paid by the trust, the representative assessee, that is the trustee, shall be responsible to pay this tax just like it was his own income. Although there will be a separate assessment of the trust, but the responsibility is on the trustee to file the income tax returns and to pay the tax on behalf of the trust. The tax is levied on the trustees in the like manner and to the same extent as it would be levyable and recoverable from the beneficiary. So although the liability is on the beneficiaries, but who will discharge it? The trustee. Who will discharge other obligations? The trustee. So trustees act like the managers and it is their responsibility to file the returns and pay the tax. In case of a specific trust, I told you, if there is business income, then it is taxed at the maximum margin rate. If it is created through a will for the benefit of the relative dependent upon him for support and maintenance, then this trust will not be liable at the maximum rate. We will pay the tax as with the rates of an individual. These are the tax rates which are applicable. As I told you, only when you have business income, you pay the maximum rate. Otherwise, you will pay the tax as per the tax rates applicable to each beneficiary. Assessment of the trust there are two possibilities. Either we can have a direct assessment on the beneficiary. If the beneficiaries are specified, their shares are specified, then a direct assessment can be made on the beneficiary. Tax can be recovered from them also, or it can be the assessment can be made on the trust as an entity, and tax can be recovered from the trust. However, we cannot have both the options. You cannot collect the tax twice, so either from the beneficiaries or from the trust. Right, the rates I have already told you. As I just mentioned that if the trust has been created through a will, for the benefit of any relative who is dependent upon the settler, then the rate of tax will be the normal rate of tax for the beneficiary. Even if there is business income, we will not tax it at the maximum rate, but at the reduced. Now, when I transfer the assets to the trust, 
do I have to pay any tax at this stage? As per section 47, transfer of capital asset to the trust, if the trust is irrevocable, is not charged to capital gains tax because this is not regarded as a transfer. So at the time of settling the property in trust, there is no liability to pay any tax. Similarly, section 56 to 10, which I discussed earlier also, mentions about certain gifts to be treated as income, but this is also not applicable where any property or any sum of money is received from an individual by a trust created or established solely for the benefit of the relative of the individual. So here we have to be very careful that the trust should be for the benefit of the relative of the individual. If the beneficiaries are any outside person who are not covered on the list of relatives, then 56 to 10 will be triggered and the tax will have to be paid at this stage also. When does the trust come to an end? These are the various circumstances which have been laid down. When the purpose is completely fulfilled, maybe I said that the trust is for the benefit of a beneficiary till the age that he acquires 21 years of age, till the acquire that he acquires 25 years of age. So as soon as he acquires 25 years of age, then the trust comes to an end. Or when the purpose becomes unlawful, as I said that the trust has to be created for a lawful purpose, if the objective itself becomes unlawful, then the trust will have to be extinguished. Or when the ful fulfillment of its purpose becomes impossible, right? I had certain property, property has been acquired by the government, compensation has been received or no compensation is received, depending on the facts, then it is the purpose of the trust is defeated. There is no other property left in the trust, so then the trust will come to an end. If the trust was for a specific time, then upon that time, the, the trust will come to an end. Right? Or if there are circumstances mentioned in the trust deed, as to when can the trustees revoke the trust. Right? If those circumstances are mentioned, then the trustee may upon that condition revoke it or bring the trust to an end. What is the difference between a will and a trust? Well, trust can be created in survivors, as we just said. While the person is, is still alive, he can create a trust. Will always comes into effect after the death of a person. In case of a will, the court oversees the administration of the will because you have to go to a court to obtain a, a probate. Then only you can administer the will. However, in case of a trust, court does not interfere. So then the, the property which goes to the trust can be managed by the trustees themselves. There is no interference on the court side. Will, will eventually become a part of public records, whereas trust may remain private. So these are certain differences between a will and a trust. Benefits of a private trust. It is a very effective and efficient mode of managing and passing of family assets. In many business houses also we have seen that the shares of the companies are not held by individuals but are held in private trust. Even large groups like Tata's, they hold their entire shareholding of companies in certain trust, in the family trust. The purpose is very clear that when the property belongs to a trust, it does not belong to an individual person. So an individual person does not get the control and management of that asset. So even if one person wants to dispose of any asset, wants to dispose of the share, he will not be able to do that. Those assets are held in the corporate trust. So this is an effective and efficient manner of holding the family assets, especially business assets, which require a very prudent manner of holding. Right? In creation of trust, both do not interfere, as I just mentioned. 
It safeguards the interest of the family members, including the maintenance of members with special needs. So if there are any persons with special needs who may not be able to take care of the property, who may not be able to manage the property themselves, may not be able to look after their interests in the family property, for them, we need to have a private trust. In many cases, it may lead to avoidance of family disputes because we know that the property will be trust, who will manage it. Individual members do not, may not manage the trust property, so therefore there are lesser chances of family disputes. We can attach conditions for the trust, as I just mentioned, upon attainment of a particular age, upon fulfillment of the wishes of the author, the property may go, go to the individual members, otherwise it goes, carries on in the private trust. So these are the benefits that we have for creating a trust. And I think this is also an effective way of holding the business assets of a trust or second main objective of having a trust for persons of special needs in the country. The challenge, as I just mentioned, is getting the right persons as trustees who can manage the trust. Tax implications, yes, there are certain tax advantages also, but that is only when you have a specific trust and the beneficiaries are specific. Otherwise, you are taxed at the maximum rate of tax. I have come across so many circumstances where people create trust, not for purposes of tax benefit. They have been creating trust for so many other purposes. And if that is the purpose of creating a trust, then we do not look at the tax advantages or disadvantages. We see at the other advantage of the trust, which are and So I think this is all that I have to discuss about the trust. Trust and wills are interrelated topics, which we could discuss in this short time span of time. Any questions that you have? on trust or on wills, if there are any questions left, we can take it. Anji uh, sir, uh, participants, we request you to have any question, you can post them in the Q&A box. Uh, sir, there is one question. Uh, bondholder trust are private trust or public trust? Bondholder trust are, are the public trust or the uh, private trust, sir? Private trust because the bonds are held against for specific person. When I say the public trust, public trust, public at large. But even if you create a bond trust, where the trust holds the bonds, it is for the benefit of certain specified person. So therefore, this is also a private trust. Ji, sir. Uh, so there is one more question by Geeta Rani ji. She is asking, Treatment of pension trust or PF trust in case of public sector undertakings. If you could throw some light on this, sir. See, provident trust, etc., or employee welfare trust, these are entirely on a different footing. These are created for the benefit of the employees. These are governed by different laws. The uh, public provident fund trust is created under a separate statute. Similarly, the employees welfare trust, many organizations have those trusts also. These are again governed by a different statute. There are different tax implications for these trusts. So these are neither under public or charitable trust. These are not governed by the Indian Trust Act. So they are governed separately altogether. Their income under the Income Tax Act at present is totally exempt from that. So these are again for the benefit of specified employees of that organization. So these are, again, we can call them in the category of private trust. These are not for the benefit of public at large. Ji, sir, thank you. Sir, there is a question by Sandeep Pathakji. 
is asking in case of ascertainable individual whether unborn children will be treated as, treated as ascertainable as beneficiaries no no see in many cases we have seen that the trust is created for certain family members and we also mentioned that all children which may be born in that family will also be beneficiaries so then we are not specifying i do not know how many children will be there so i cannot define their share also then this will be called a discretionary right so then this is not a specific trust in case of a specific trust i must know what beneficiary i must know their share of the benefit right i can have a benefit for an unborn child also i can have a trust for them but then this is a discretionary जी सर सर एज सच आई कैन नॉट फाइंड एनी क्वेश्चन आई थिंक द लेक्चर एंड प्रेजेंटेशन वॉज वेरी मच सेल्फ एक्सप्लेनेटरी सर एवरीथिंग इज क्लियर आई प्रिज्यूम जी जी सर बिल्कुल सर so uh, sir with your permission shall we wind up the session yes i think uh, yes unless until there are any other observation any other uh, i i will just have a look once more sir um so there is one question uh, like uh, in the latest income tax act of 2020 with respect to trust uh, there is a lot of revision to the old provisions so whether we can get benefits of what was given um, in 2020 finance act there have been a lot of amendments mainly related to registration of charitable trusts so all the amendments are in the field of charitable trust nothing regarding private trust and most of these amendments have been postponed to the next year so for this year there is nothing major amendment in under the income tax act all these amendments related to registration etc will become applicable from 1st of april 21 where all the charitable trusts will again have to see to fresh registration now registration will be applicable only for 5 years every 5 years you will have to get a fresh registration unlike the earlier provisions where once a trust was registered on income tax it was in perpetuity So those amendments have been made, which will be effective from the next year. As regards private trust, which we are discussing, there are no major changes in the Finance Act 2020. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, so now I will take a privilege to propose a vote of thanks for this session, sir. Um, so thank you so much for uh, coming here and pouring your maybe a little portion of your immense knowledge over us. um we are truly privileged and truly honored to have you amongst us i'm too small to say anything sir but the topic uh, of uh, today's topic will viability and validity and formation of trust and its taxation they were very interesting and relevant topics sir and the way you have taught them they have become even more engrossing sir um uh, so yes. learn oh then i will be here with you tomorrow discuss another topic on capital ji sir uh, and uh, learning the nitty gritties of this topic from the pioneer like you is actually an incentive for all of us sir uh, very appropriately you have said sir and explained in the slides that we all know that we are going to be here maybe for next few uh, years or maybe longer but it's very much essential to execute our will for the smooth succession of our property thank you so much sir uh, we are hoping we are going to meet you tomorrow sir and uh, we are going to enjoy that session as well sir please accept due regards from dr sp agarwal sir dr jail gupta sir c dr sanjeev singh sir dr rekha dayal ma'am dr anjali gupta ma'am and all other team members of the teaching learning center ramanujan college and indian accounting association and cr chapter thank you so much sir my regards to all of them definitely sir certainly thank you thank you sir should i close the session now hanji pushottam sir thank you you can close the session okay thank you